Hello and welcome to the Particular Baptist Podcast. My name is Daniel Vincent, here with my co-host Sean Cheatham. Uh, we can be found at reformpodcast.com and other podcasting platforms such as Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and Google Podcasts. Today we have a special guest with us, Dr. James Ranahan, coming to us from Mansfield, Texas, uh, to discuss the First London Baptist Confession of Faith. Uh, Dr. Renahan, thank you for joining us today. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you for inviting me. You're very welcome. Um, so before we dive into our topic on the, the First London Baptist Confession of Faith, can you give us a little bit of background about yourself for our audience? Uh, sure. Um, I was brought to faith in Christ when I was 15, uh, quite a long time ago. I've uh, been married to my wife for 40 Let's see, it'll be 43 years in a month. Uh, we have five children and 11 grandchildren. Um, two of my sons are pastors in Reformed Baptist churches. All of my kids have made professions of faith and are uh, seeking to follow Christ. Um, I uh, have been working with IRBS since 1998. Uh, began the program that we started at Westminster Seminary in California. And then about three years ago, uh, it was decided to move here to Texas and develop a full seminary program. And so we've been living here uh, since then. Um, and uh, very thankful to God for all of his blessings and uh, his persevering grace. Amen. Amen. And it's encouraging to see um, Reformed Baptist uh, theology being uh, promulgated again um, in, in the seminary. So we appreciate your work in that, Pastor. Thank you. And with that, um, Sean, will you start our topic off today? Yeah, sure. So as Dan said, we're going to actually be focusing on the uh, First London uh, Baptist Confession of Faith today. We as uh, particular Baptists, as Reformed Baptists, often talk about the Second London Baptist Confession of Faith. But we, uh, we want to focus at least a little bit on the First London Baptist Confession today and do a little bit of comparison. And I can say for myself that this is a little bit of a, a personal topic. Um, prior to me coming to the uh, church I'm at now, uh, I was dissuaded from joining a Reformed Baptist church. I was told that, um, oh, you don't want to, you don't want to go to a church that has the Second London Baptist Confession of Faith. You actually want to go to one that has the First London Baptist Confession of Faith. That's a mm -hmm. much more solid doc document. So I was under the impression that these were um, very different documents. But as uh, we'll see in this interview, that's not necessarily the uh, the case. Not necessarily. Um, well, no. Um, so first question, um, why is the First London Baptist Confession of Faith important to study given the wide adoption of the, uh, the 1689, the Second London Baptist Confession of Faith? Yeah, that's a good place to start. Um, you guys probably know that I'm in the midst of a project to write expositions of both the First London and the Second London Confession. And my manuscript for the First London is at the publishers and should be out this year. And um, in the, the introduction or the preface to the book, I try to address questions like this. The First London Confession is the original particular Baptist confession. Um, of course, uh, Matt Bingham has made the point that they wouldn't have recognized in 1644 the title particular Baptist. Uh, he wants to suggest that it's better to use the phrase congregationalist, uh, Baptistic congregationalist. Uh, and, I, and that makes a really good and important point uh, but let's, we'll use it uh, just for the sake of, of discussion because that's popular. Uh, it was the original Confession of Faith of the Particular Baptists. It was published for very specific purposes. It helped to identify who they were, and it also helped to um, ameliorate the dangers that they faced, both political and theological, uh, in, in what was really a very volatile circumstance in 1644, then again in 1646 when it was revised, and then a uh, third time slightly revised, not, not very much, but a little bit in 1651. Um, and so uh, to me, I, I had to begin my um, book writing project with this Confession of Faith because I believe that it's the, the foundation and the basis upon which the Second London is built. Um, in order to understand one, you need to understand the other. And uh, so let's start at the beginning and deal with First London, think about it and its structure and its contents, and then move on to Second London. So why did they feel the need to create the First uh, London Baptist Confession of Faith? And, and there is a wide gap in terms of the years, obviously, 1644 to 1689. Um, it, 
So there's a wide gap, I guess, in theological thought that could be there. But starting with the first one, what were the theological uh, issues that were surrounding it and some of the historical implications there? Yeah, um, um, Dr. Bingham has demonstrated really well that the, the First London Confession appears four to six weeks after a demand that was made by the Westminster Assembly and Parliament to the what were then called anti-pedobaptists, that is, the, these brand new churches that were against the practice of infant baptism. The Westminster Assembly and Parliament demanded that they make a public declaration of their views because they were thought to have been heterodox and because they were circulating a variety of rumors about the dangers that were uh, supposedly present if a group like these anti pedo baptists were tolerated. So it's, its provenance is really um, in response to a demand that came from both political and religious authorities with a great deal of power. Um, of course, Dr. Bingham fleshes that out at great length, but I think he, he makes a really powerful case that, um, you know, it wasn't uh, 15 men from seven churches getting together and say, hey, what do we believe? Let's, uh, let's talk about what we believe. But rather, it was a response um, to a potentially very dangerous situation. Yeah, and I, when I first read about that, I, I didn't know much about the history behind the first one, but um, it was very interesting. Um, it was a way that they were, you know, you had the Anabaptist rumors going around and you had this idea that if you weren't subscribing to paedo baptism, you were just simply an Anabaptist. The distinctions, proper distinctions weren't made. And it's, it seems like they were trying to d distinguish themselves from the rest of the Anabaptist community and saying, yeah. look, we're, we're not those guys. We believe something different. That's exactly right. Uh, you know, in 1642, so two years before the appearance of the First London or the first edition of the First London, there was an anonymous pamphlet that was published that was brilliantly, um, uh, it was brilliant propaganda. And what it was, was simply the story, the retelling of events that had taken place about 100 years before in the city of Mün Münster in Northern Germany, when uh, a, a group of wild-eyed fanatics who were <laughs> called the Anabaptists um, really uh, took over the town, drove out everybody who disagreed with them, began practicing um, polygamy, um, it was a horrible situation, but that what what happened in Munster became the paradigm for any attacks against anyone who stepped outside of the boundaries of traditional pedo Baptist orthodoxy. Those were Anabaptists. Now we have Anabaptists in London, and this um, the the danger that took place in Munster is the danger that we face right now. Part of the brilliance of that pamphlet, which probably was uh, written by Daniel Featley, who was a member of the Westminster Assembly. One of the brilliant things about it is it simply tells the story until the last sentence or two, which basically says, let, let King Charles beware. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's, he's basically saying what happened across the channel in Germany could happen again now if we don't do something about this immediately. And so they were, they were faced with a situation that, um, could have landed them all in jail. And sometimes it did. It even could have um, forced their exile or, in worst case scenario, um, uh, martyrdom. Now, that, that didn't mm. happen, but it, could, it potentially could have because the voices that were against them were very loud. Um, they were, you know, they were trolling th these, these churches, really, to use modern language. And it's this, you know, nowadays people say if it's on the internet, it has to be true. Well, back then, if it was in print, it had to be true. Whether it was a lie, whether it was slander, it was considered by many to be true. And they were the objects of this kind of slanderous pamphlet and, and book war. And so when the Westminster Assembly and Parliament made a demand of them that they step forward and give an honest declaration of their faith, they were ameliorating the, these potential dangers. And they were trying to say, we're like you. We share with you the same kind of orthodoxy. We are not Anabaptists. So they were doing mm. everything that they possibly could to distance themselves from Munster and everybody else on the continent who was considered to be a wild-eyed fanatic. They, they wanted to say, we are peaceful um, Christians 
who are seeking to serve the Lord according to our consciences, and our consciences require of this, this, this path that we're following, which means we can't be part of the Church of England, and no longer can we submit to the practice of infant baptism because we don't see that the Word of God teaches it. And so that has forced us uh, to make these conclusions. Uh, uh, you know, the, the, the Confession of Faith has to be seen in that light as a document that is saying we're like you, not, not we're dissimilar to you, but that we believe the things that you do. And what's really interesting, as I worked with all of the literature that surrounds the Confession of Faith, is to see how begrudgingly many of the men who wrote against them um, acknowledge the orthodoxy of the Confession of Faith. Begrudgingly, sometimes with, um, well, I'll give you an example. Daniel Featley, who was this member of the Westminster Assembly and is one of the most important critics, maybe not the most important, but one of the most important, um, said that, that there were only six or seven problems with the confession. Almost all of them surrounded the doctrine of believer's baptism, which, you know, <laughs> if, I can, if I can lapse into the vernacular here and say, duh, you know, <laughs> what, what do you expect, right? They're, they're, they're rejecting infant baptism. He, he couldn't find anything unorthodox about the rest of the statements of the confession of faith. But what he says was, um, there is a little bit of poison that's covered in a lot of rat's bane. Uh, I'm sorry, the rat's bane is the poison covered up in sugar. So, you know, the, the trap is set. You, if you want to kill a rat, you put the poison in the middle and then you cover it up with something that will attract the rat to come and eat. And as he's eating, he doesn't pay attention. He eats the poison and dies. That's, that's what he says. It's orthodox, but there must be something more nefarious here, things that they're not telling <laughs> us. Um, so very dangerous situation, but that, that you're, you're right. They wanted to distance themselves from the Anabaptists, but even more so, they wanted to uh, relieve the political pressures that they were facing in the mid-1640s. We, we also have to remember that it was a time of civil war. Mm. Par Parliament and the king were at war. And um, because they're in London, and London is the parliamentary stronghold, when Parliament makes a demand, it, it's very important to pay attention to what Parliament says and find a way to... Um, as best as you're able to do so, work with the parliament. And so they present a document that says, we're like you. Mm. Yeah, that's very interesting. And it almost sounds like the, um, the or whoever wrote that pamphlet was kind of poisoning the well. So once these other, you know, anti pedo baptists came on the scene, it was like, wait, wait, they must be those guys because look what we read over here. That's exactly what, what was happening. Exactly, precisely, yeah. Mm. Yeah. All right. And, and in terms of, you know, they submit this document to the Westminster Assembly at the re oh. at the uh, request of Parliament. Uh, why did they receive the pushback? You talked a little bit about the, the pedo baptism, um, but what really drove that? Um, yeah, a couple of things. Of course, we could repeat what we've already done about suspicion about Munster and the Anabaptists and political turmoil and all the rest. And here, here we are at war with the king. If we allow these people to come in, everything will fall apart. There'll be no more society. But also there was um, a sense of uh, the, the Church of England had always existed as a church. And essentially the Church of England was the religious body that was equivalent to the political body in the nation. It was the national church. Your... Um, citizenship, although they weren't citizens, they were subjects of the crown, but let's use the word citizen, okay? Your citizenship, you, when, when you and I are born, we receive from the political authority where we're born a, a birth certificate that, that says things about who we are, where we're born, and that's an important document in our lives. Because we use it for passports and driver's licenses and all the rest, okay? Your birth certificate in the 1640s was not issued to you by the crown, by the king, or by parliament, it was the record of your baptism that was kept by the local vicar in the parish church where you mm. were baptized. And so the, that's why I say the Church of England was the religious side of the political body in the nation, and they worked very closely together. And so when, when a group of people separate from that body, they suddenly give the outward appearance of being treasonous, of mm. being separatists, uh, and, and they're doing something that is largely unknown in the history of England. Why are these people doing this? Why can't they be part of our church? In fact, when you read the literature from the critics, that often comes up. Why have you separated? 
And, and that continues all the way through the 17th century. You know, if I can broaden this out just a little bit and talk about the Congregationalists, when they were driven out of the Church of England in 1662 at the Great Ejection, um, their consciences wouldn't allow them to participate in the Church of England, and their opponents, the, the Church of England uh, apologists, are pressing that really hard on these Puritans who separated. Uh, you're, you're violating Christ's command to, for unity. What right do you have to separate from us? What does that say about us? Are you saying that we're not true churches? So all of those things that happened in 1662 to the, the Presbyterians and the Congregationalists who separated from the Church of England 20 years earlier are also being thrown at these Baptistic Congregationalists or particular Baptists. Um, you know, th there's a whole lot in this story that needs to be recognized. And I, I think that too often the story has not been told in its fullness and people have approached that confession of faith uh, without understanding the circumstances and what it was all about and what it was trying to do and have made assumptions about it that simply don't hold up in the light of careful historical research. Hmm. Yeah, and that's a good point. You you bring up the church and state relationship there that um, really influenced that. If you weren't baptized as an infant, then you were not considered a citizen necessarily. That's, that's very interesting. Um, and Sean, if you want to add anything else, feel free. Oh, wow. no, that was, that was perfectly, uh, perfectly clear. Um, so even though the first London confession was written in, uh, originally written in 1644, it went through a couple of, uh, updates and revisions. Um, why, uh, how many additions did there end up being and why were these additions made? Yeah, that's, that's a good question too, because it, it helps to, helps us to understand this whole narrative as it moves forward. In 1644, it's published, and it begins to be noticed in the broader Pedobaptist literature. Um, by my count, there are about eight major opponents who go into print against it, but also there are, there are three, four, five others who mention it along the way as um, a document that they can't accept. So you, you have 10, maybe a dozen mentions of it by different people at different times. In the 1644 edition was almost immediately criticized by Daniel Featley, again, a prominent member of the Westminster Assembly uh, for a time. He, for, for various reasons, he was put out of the Westminster Assembly, interestingly enough, mostly because he was a royalist and not a parliamentarian. But that's, that's another story that's fascinating, but it's beside our, our story today. He criticized it. And, um, the, the time lapse between the publication of 1644 and 1646 is only about 14 months, even though the dates mm. look like they're two years apart. It, you know, it's, it's really the end of 1644 and early in 1646, so approximately 14 months between the two. It's really interesting that some of the change, well, all of the criticisms that Featley made of 1644 edition, the Baptists altered in the 1646 edition to ameliorate Featley's criticism. That is, they're in a sense giving in. Someone might say, and I'm not saying this, someone would say they compromised with Dr. Featley because they gave in to his criticism. I would say, no, you got that wrong. Actually, what they did was they, they were fulfilling their original purpose, which was to say, we agree with you. And if somebody points out that we're deficient or we phrased ourselves poorly in this place, then we're willing to make a change in order to concede to you that that wasn't the best way to express something. We will express it in terms that you are more likely to find. Now, there are, there are more changes than just the six or seven criticisms of Featley in 1646. You also have um, an interesting difference between the two is that the 1644 edition was written largely by laymen. Um, I don't know of any of them who had had any formal training in one of the universities or who were ministers in the Church of England. But by the time you come to 1646, they have been joined by um, five, six, seven men who come out of Oxford or Cambridge and who have been serving as ministers in the Church of England. So now you have the addition of some other theologians, perhaps to challenge statements that are made in 1644 and um, refine it. Now, what's really interesting is some of the statements that they changed actually made it worse than what it was before. <laughs> and Robert Bailey, 
I think Bailey is probably the most important critic of First London. Bailey was another uh, member of the Westminster Assembly. He was a Scottish commissioner. Bailey spends a lot of time detailing the problems in the 1646 edition. I work through them. In fact, what, one of the things that I do in the book is that I deal with all of these criticisms and try to respond to them. Why is this a good criticism? Why is this a bad criticism? How does this help us to understand what the confession is all about? So um, not, not all of the changes that were made in 1646 were necessarily positive changes. The most, um, the most difficult to deal with is the deletion of some material on the doctrine of the Trinity. Now, I handle that at length in the book. I won't take the time to do that here. But, but Bailey rightly criticizes the 1646 edition and the changes that it made from 1644 um, in, in the way that they phrase themselves on the doctrine of the Trinity. 1651, you've got another five years that pass. And in, in each of these circumstances, the 44, 46, 51, the political circumstances of the day have changed. 1644, there's a civil war going on. 1646, basically parliament has triumphed over the king. 1651, now you have the uh, the the, the uh, Commonwealth era where it's it's not really parliament so much as anymore, it's Oliver Cromwell has come to power. Mm -hmm. And what's really interesting about the, the period from 1649 when the king is executed to 1660 when his son returns, when the restoration as it's called is, because England had never been in a political circumstance without a king, they didn't know how to govern themselves. And mm -hmm. so you find several different attempts that are made during that period of time to find a method of government apart from parliament and king that could work for the nation. And finally, they, they give up, they throw up their hands, and they invite the king to come back. And that's when everything turns, turns bad again. So much of the 1651 revisions, which are, are minor compared to the, the changes of 1646. Most of those changes have to do more with the changing political circumstances um, that, that surround the nation. Um, well, does that make sense? Yeah, no, it makes perfect sense. And I think it's uh, important too that you bring up that they were trying to identify themselves with the broader reform community mm -hmm. and say, look, we believe, especially um, as it relates to covenant theology, the particular Baptist did, you know, look, we, we believe what you guys believe for the most part, but here's our, our differences. Uh, and yeah. I think that's something that is missed in the discussion. You know, you know, what's interesting about that. We, I mentioned that there are, there are eight key um, critics who write, pardon me, who write at length about the confession of faith, but, and then maybe four or five or six others along the way, all of those critics were doing everything that they could um, to uncover the unorthodoxies, heterodoxies of these Baptistic Congregationalists. And none of them, now, I mean, Bailey critiques them on the doctrine of the Trinity. He's concerned about um, the possible um, language of justification from eternity that appears uh, in the 1646 revision. There, there are other things that are present. They never, ever mention unorthodoxy with regard to the law of God, the, the place of the moral law in the life of the believer. They yeah. never point out that these people have deviated from um, covenant theology as it's accepted and practiced in the mid-1640s. And that would have been um, central to their argument to say these people are completely unorthodox. Look look what they've done. They're antinomians in that they deny the... the, the uh, uh, continuation of the moral law, for example, that that would have been the right kind of ammunition to use, but you never find them doing that. And I think that that's of great significance. Uh, if these guys are turning over every stone and trying to find every creepy crawly that's underneath the stones, and they find all kinds of things, but they don't find those things, uh, there's reasons for that. And the reason is that's not where the problems rested with the particular the early particular Baptists. And what's amazing is that the Anabaptists were the ones who were being more antinomian, especially as it relates to the state. Um, and even in light of that clear evidence from their uh, from the particular Baptist confessions, they were still called that. Uh, it just shows the the pure bias that was there. Yeah, and you know it's really interesting if you if you think about that. 
much of their writing uh, at the latter part of First London is about the relationship that Christians are to have to the political authorities over them, whether it's the king or the parliament or, or whatever it is. And they, they phrase it in a very traditional way as they do so in light of the fifth commandment, honor your father and your mother. Because you know that the, the fifth commandment was viewed historically as not simply a commandment that had to deal with familial relationships, but the family stood as a paradigm for society at large. Mm. And so to keep, to honor your father and your mother meant not just your parents, but also those that God has set over you in the, the political arena. And so that's the defense that they use. They, they call in very traditional language that relates directly to the fifth commandment as they express themselves in terms of their relationship to the government. And basically what they say is, we will do everything that the government demands of us that is that we in good conscience can follow. But when the government demands of us things in terms of worship uh, that, are, that go beyond the word of God, that's where we can't follow you. And so, you know, that the whole context of their obedience to political authorities is the fifth commandment. Mm. Which is grounded in the moral law. Exactly. Exactly yep. right. Yeah. Amen. Interesting. Yeah. So going to, um, you know, we're talking about the different confessions. Um, so specifically for the 1644 and the 1689, what are significant differences between the two? Well, can I can I just correct you here? Um, don't, sure. Don't, don't take it personally. Sure. But the Second London Confession was actually first published in 1677. That is true. Okay, so so yes. we refer to it, I, I tend not to, I t like to call it the Second London rather than the 1689, because actually we don't have any indication that it was published in 1689. It was adopted. At least. It was adopted, right? Yeah. 77, yep. 88, and 99 are the, the known editions of it. So there's a, there's a gap between 1651 and 1677 of 26 years, more or less, uh, between the two. Um, what was your question again? What are, are the, what are the uh, significant differences between the two? Okay, yeah. Um, that's, that's a good question. Um, the, the shape of each confession of faith, to a large degree, is formed by the source documents upon which it relies. Mm. Okay? So the first London confession relies upon a couple of very important earlier um, manuscripts. One of them is the 1596 True Confession that was written by exiles from England. They're in the, the Netherlands. Um, Henry Ainsworth, the famous uh, Hebrew scholar and pastor of one of the separatist independent churches in the Netherlands, is thought to have been the author of the 1596 Confession. It uh, the, the particular Baptists take about half of that Confession of Faith and use that half in their own confession. So to a large degree, it shapes the theology and the things that are emphasized in the 1596 True Confession are to a large degree the things that we find present in First London. They also incorporated a good bit of material from William Ames's very mm. famous and wonderful work, The Marrow of Theology, mm -hmm. um, especially when it comes to sections that are not taken from uh, the true confession, but rather uh, in, I think it's articles nine through 20, are not based on the true confession. That's the whole soteriology section. Um, that's where you see a lot of William Ames. Um, mm -hmm. On the offices, the, the triplex office of Christ, prophet, priest, and king, um, Ames's influence is very powerful there. So the, the shape of First London is dependent upon the documents upon which it's based. The same is true with Second London. Now, they, in the preface, one of the, the complaints that I have, I don't know if that's a good word or a bad word, but one of the complaints I have about most of the editions of the Second London Confession of Faith that have been published in the 20th and 21st century is that the, the editions don't include the letter to the judicious and impartial reader, which begins the, the body of the confession, and the appendix at the end, which gives some further arguments for believer's baptism. You usually get, you, you open it up and it's chapter one of the Holy Scriptures and you read through to the end and it's uh, of the last judgment and then it's over. And you haven't seen the letter at the beginning 
and you haven't seen the appendix. Well, in that uh, epistle to the judicious and impartial reader, they, they make a very clear statement that the, the First London Confession, copies of it are rare at, by the time you get to 1677, and circumstances have changed. Uh, they, they, because they want to do the same thing that the first did and show their agreement with the pedo-baptists around them, they've decided to use the better known Westminster Confession and its 1658 revision by the Congregationalists known as the Savoy Declaration, mm -hmm. which means that the shape of those documents now affects the shape of the second London Confession of Faith. Interestingly enough though, there's a lot of material from first London that's brought over into the second London Confession of Faith. Now, mm -hmm. in, in that epistle to the judicious and impartial reader, they make the statement not only that there are a few copies available of First London, but that the doctrines that are taught in the two confessions are the same. Mm. The, the phraseology and the wording is different, but the doctrines are the same. Um, that Now, that bears itself out. If you remember what we said earlier, when these pedo-baptists were searching for ways to show its unorthodoxy, they didn't point to the things that are more clearly articulated implied in First London, but clearly articulated in Second London. Um, so I, I, I don't think that you can say that there are any significant doctrinal differences between the two confessions, although we need to say there are some minor doctrinal differences between each of the three editions of the First London. That's mm -hmm. why it was revised three times. And so not every word and every phrase of First London is repeated in Second London, nor does Second London necessarily rely in every form upon First London. For example, there's nothing in the First London Confession about uh, lawful oaths and vows, mm. and yet that's a chapter that we find in the Second London. There's nothing really about marriage in the First London, but we find that in the Second London. And so is that a doctrinal difference? I don't think so. Um, you know, they believed in marriage in 1644 and 46 in the same way that they believed in marriage in 1677. But the 1677 confession has a, a, a very helpful, useful statement on marriage. I think one that we need today and that protects us from some of the attacks that are being made against um, traditional Christian mm. marriage in the 21st century. It's a wonderful statement that really perfectly summarizes what the word of God teaches about that. So I don't know that there are any, uh, I would argue that there are not any significant doctrinal differences, but I would continue by saying this. When charges of unorthodoxy in matters such as the doctrine of the Trinity or a, another deficiency, let's put it that way. I, I don't like to use that word. I don't mean that in the worst sense. I'm just using it to say maybe something that could have been present that wasn't. But a deficiency in First London is that there's there's no real statement on imputation mm. in First London. You, you don't have a doctrine of imputation and you have some potentially wonky language on the doctrine of the Trinity. Now, I would argue that because the men who published Second London state that the, the methodology of expressing the doctrines is different, but the, the, the substance of doctrine is the same, I, I, my, one of my arguments in the book is that First London needs Second London in order to make it, to demonstrate its orthodoxy. Mm. If, if there are wonky statements on the Trinity or there's an absence of a clear teaching on imputation in First London, Second London beautifully supplies those things. And when you, when you look, for example, at chapter two of Second London, of God and of the Holy Trinity, there's a lot of First London's material that is brought into um, that chapter in, in Second London, but then expanded and directly addresses the criticisms that Robert Bailey makes about the, I already used the word wonky, Trinitarianism <laughs> that may be present in First London. You see, so you it needs Second London in order to demonstrate that it's not an unorthodox or heterodox or even potentially heretical Trinitarian doctrine in First London, but the only way to make that clear is to read it in the light of the fact that its statements were incorporated and expanded into Second London. So uh, that's why I, I said earlier on in our discussion that um, I wanted to begin my work uh, in publishing on these things with First London to show the interrelationships between the two. Mm -hmm. They need each other. Second London is built upon the foundation of First London. 
And First London requires Second London to demonstrate that its statements are orthodox. And to, to think of one without the other is um, really to separate documents that belong together. Mm. Yeah, that's yeah, that's very interesting. And especially, uh, I think we can sometimes fall into the word concept fallacy with regards to these confessions. Oh, you know, yeah. If they didn't say it, yeah. then they probably didn't believe it. Um, right. I think a perfect example that your son Sam brings out in his dissertation on the covenant of works. You know, so, mm -hmm. you know, just because they don't necessarily use that word in chapter seven does not mean they they didn't believe it. Yeah. So it, it's piecing yeah. these different confessions together and looking at it in its broader context that helps us to see what they did believe. Yeah, yeah, and, and you know, let, let's let's just can I follow up on that a little sure. bit? Sure. Um, the seven churches that originally adopted the First London Confession of Faith, um, four or five of them signed off on the Second London when it was published. Mm. Two of them, maybe three, were out of business by then. They they had folded for one reason or another. They were no longer in existence. But all of the existing churches joined up uh, and, and subscribed publicly in 1689 mm -hmm. to the Second London Confession of Faith. All right. Now, that's, that's a generation between um, the First London and the Second. But you know what? People live that long. Um, Hansard Knowles was born in 1598. And he didn't die until 1691. He signed the first London. He signed the second London. William Kiffin was a young man born in 1616. Mm. So he was, what, um, uh, not quite 30 years old when 1644 Confession came out. But his name is at the top of the list of subscribers to the second London Confession of Faith. You had the same churches. You had several of the same men. And you had father-son um, subscribers. Um, you had Benjamin Cox in the first one and his son Nehemiah in the second. Nehemiah is probably the editor of the second London. You had Edward Harrison from the Petty France Church in the first London and his son Thomas Harrison in the second second London. The, the same men, the same churches. Um, did they change their doctrines over the, the period of time between the issuance of the first and the second? Show me. Show me the evidence. Show me somewhere that, that says that they did this. And you know what? No one has been able to come forward and demonstrate that evidence. What you have is people in the 20th or 21st century looking back and, and making the word concept fallacy that you just mentioned. It's not there. It's not there in the way that it is in Second London. So therefore, it must have been a different doctrine. Uh, it doesn't work like that. It, it, mm. there's, there's no basis in scholarship. Um, there's no basis in the writings. I think that I've read every particular Baptist book from the 17th century, it's not there. Mm. And the critics would have seen it if it were there. It just isn't. So that 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 driving a wedge between the two confessions uh, and and you know saying, well, the, the first London is the true Baptist confession and the second <laughs> London is the, the compromised one, it, it's pure nonsense. There is no real basis in historical fact for such such an assertion. In fact, what's really interesting is that First London in the 1646 edition, because they were willing to make changes to concede to the pedo-baptist criticisms, I think is more susceptible to that criticism that says, you know what, they were just compromising with the pedo-baptist document. In fact, by, by adopting Westminster and Savoy or using those as the base documents for the Second London Confession, what really what they're doing is they're identifying with a persecuted minority. Mm. They're identifying with men who have been driven out of the Church of England, who are subject to all of the stipulations of the Clarendon Code, the Five Mile Act, where you couldn't minister uh, anywhere within five miles of where you had formerly lived. You couldn't teach school. Um, it's why so many of them went to jail. The Baptists are actually exposing themselves to, to danger. They're, mm. they're not adopting something that will keep them out of trouble. They're actually leading themselves into deeper trouble by identifying themselves with these uh, pedo-baptist uh, Puritans. So uh, the, the whole argument falls apart completely, absolutely, thoroughly falls apart. Yeah, I think that shows the importance of recovering particular Baptist history so we can not fall into these pitfalls. Right, exactly. But but you know what, you know what happens? Uh, urban legends abound, right? If somebody says it, <laughs> somebody repeats it, and somebody repeats it, and somebody repeats it, then it becomes canon. Mm. And you have to challenge mm. the, the yep. and say, okay, you might be able to get 100 people who'll say this, 
But let's go to the source and find out what the source says. And if the source debunks what the hundred people say, you, you, you prove, you demonstrate that it's just an urban legend. That's all it is. And so we have to become theological myth busters mm. in this case. You know, that's what we have to do. Yes. Yeah. And I think that leads us into our, our next two questions here. Um, I think we actually might have covered everything um, just in, unintentionally, but covered all the questions. Um, I did have, this might be a little bit of a, a curveball for you uh, there, because uh, we didn't uh, give you this question beforehand. But um, uh, it sounds like uh, you're saying that the uh, the second London is is basically the mature um, confession for uh, the particular Baptists. Would you say that that's a good reason to adopt the uh, the second London as opposed to the first London? I think that that's a good way to phrase it. Mm -hmm. That it, it does express um, a greater theological maturity. Although I, I say in the book, I think the first London Confession of Faith is actually a very good confession of mm -hmm. faith. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I am of the opinion that what we ought to do is we ought to have a Baptist three forms of unity. Mm -hmm. And the three forms of unity are the first London Confession, the second London Confession, and the Baptist Catechism. Mm -hmm. I, I think, you know, I think that that's what we ought to do. And don't be surprised if you see sometime in the near future, some institutions um, <laughs> doing just that and, and perhaps adopting three forms of Baptist unity because of the commonalities that are present among them. But yes, you're right to say that, uh, you know, even when Presbyterians looked at the three Westminster, the major Westminster documents, the Confession of Faith, the Shorter Catechism, and the Larger Catechism. They will argue that there's a, a, a kind of maturity or, or um, sharpening of language the, the later you go, so that the, mm -hmm. the Larger Catechism is somewhat more precise, perhaps, at places than the Confession of Faith is. And so maybe we could say that there is a progression from 1644 to 1646, to 1651, to 1677, ultimate, and then to 16, pardon me, 1693. And all of those show a, a, a refinement and a precision and, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, maturity. That's your word, that great word, mm -hmm. in, in the way that they were able to express their doctrine. Mm -hmm. It does really go to show you that um, theology does need time to develop, or at least at least language needs uh, time to develop in order to get things precisely right. We don't expect necessarily that um, the first time somebody makes a, a document, a statement of faith, that it's going to be precisely exactly how you would want to word it, that it's time and other people looking at it that really brings out um, how precisely you want to say things. Yeah, yeah, that, that's well said. Um, there's there's another factor too that um, I meant to to talk about in why the 1677 takes a different shape to the 1644, and that is um, if any of you have read Sam's books um, uh, from Shadow to Substance or the Petty France Church, he I, I think he makes a really strong argument for the historical circumstances in 1676 and 77 that led to the publication of that Confession of Faith. It's a long story, but it has to do with a man named Thomas Collier, who was sent mm -hmm. out from London to the West Country uh, under, basically under the first London Confession of Faith and developed very, not just heterodox, but heretical views and had to be responded to. They had to write about him. The, 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 it was a big, big, big problem. And uh, he had published a book in 1676 called The Confession of Faith that is really heterodox and it places heretical, but it could purport to be the doctrines of the particular Baptist churches because of his prominence and his importance. And with, with all kinds of things that need to be told in that story, and you can find them in Sam's books, our Confession of Faith appears suddenly as a result. And it directly addresses some of the problems uh, in the theological views of Thomas Collier. So, so that, that it's not just that uh, the Westminster Confession and the Savoy Declaration were more popular and they decided to use those things, but they needed to be able to express themselves quite precisely mm. uh, in the face of this very serious defection 
of Thomas Collier. I was reading some some of the material today in in a book that was published against Collier, and uh, his his views were really really strange, uh, idiosyncratic in the worst way across the board. Was he an Arminian? Was he Socinian? Uh, what what was he? He seems to just have taken all kinds of different things and put them together like um, you know mashed potatoes, and you end up with something terrible uh, was the result. So so the confession of faith in that historical context uh, demonstrates the orthodoxy of the the the, the hundred churches that more than a hundred churches that adopted it in the face of the defection of somebody very prominent. Hmm. Yeah, and, and Collier was no uh, small name among particular Baptists either, which didn't help the situation. No, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, I think that's all we have for today in terms of our discussion. Uh, very good discussion. Uh, you know, this is one of our goals it, with this podcast is to bring forth our history, our rich uh, history as particular Baptists and, and help to preserve it. So, uh, Dr. Renahan, thank you for joining us today and, and helping with that discussion. My pleasure. Thank you for inviting me on. appreciate a lot. You're very welcome. Uh, and with that, Lord willing, we will be back uh, next week for our next episode. With that, everyone have a great Lord's Day and a great weekend. God bless. God bless.